So today uh, we are looking at chapters 15 and 16 of the book uh, by Paula Moraga on spatial statistics for data science. And so chapter 15 is about model-based geostatistics, uh, where we want to understand that random effects of statistical models can be a Gaussian random field or GRF. And we also want to see how to fit models with spatial correlation using R in math. So in these slides, I will synthesize actually what is the procedure in the book and uh, the, the ideas of the book, uh, but not so much actually execute or code simply because I couldn't manage to download the data. But I think the most important is to understand the steps and, uh, we can have a look at the chapter itself as well to look at some outputs in the meantime so the aim is to fit a statistical model that can support various distribution families for the response variable that can accommodate fixed and random effects and that can capture spatial correlation structure as a random effect and that also provides spatial predictions with uh, with uncertainty measures so these are uh, somewhat higher expectations um, compared to previous chapters where we also saw some interpolation methods, uh, including the Krieging method. And in this case, we will specify the spatial random effect as a Gaussian random field with zero mean and a Matern correlation, which we already saw earlier on. So when we will do this using the R package INLA, and INLA is a method that can fit models containing Gaussian Markov random field, which is actually a subset with, with uh, a bit more specific conditions. And it does this fitting of this, this um, GMRF uh, by solving a stochastic partial differential equation. So the formulas are in the book, but in my feeling, there's they are not that that much explained. But anyhow, this is a mathematical equation which uh, can be solved, and so the solution of this SPDE will yield the Gaussian Markov random fields. So, and it is solved specifically in space on the vertices of a triangulated mesh. So, for specific locations. And generating uh, this GMRF by solving the SPD on the mesh can be controlled by setting the smoothest parameter of the spatial autocorrelation and also by specifically or explicitly requ requiring zero mean. So GMRF values fitted at vertices are then interpolated to locations of interest. Uh, either fitted values at observation locations or predicted values at prediction locations. So let's have a look in the chapter just to, to get an idea of what it looks like. So this is how such a mesh is uh, looking like. So this is based on provided coordinates. So uh, typically the observation locations are provided to create a mesh. And some um, yeah, parameters are provided to, to set minimum or maximum length of the yeah of the of the pieces between the vertices. So this is a triangulated mesh, and you can see two areas with shorter distances and longer distances, and they try to accommodate locations at the vertices actually, uh, but. This also depends on the parameters that have been provided. So if two locations are too close together, they won't all be on vertices, for example. So this is how a mesh looks like. And so at the vertices, a GRMF, GMRF uh, will be um, generated. So then they are interpolated to locations of interest once these have been generated at the vertices. And to make these interpolations, we need a projection matrix. It defines the relation between the locations and the mesh vertices in space by means of weights. So 
The rows of this matrix represent the locations of interest. These can be observation, but also the predictions, because if you want to, to, to get predicted values at new locations, yeah, then you also have to define the position of those new locations relative to the, to the vertices of the mesh. So the rows represent the locations of interest. The columns represent the mesh vertices. The values in the matrix or the barycentric coordinates of locations of interest relative to the three vertices of a triangle where the location is in. So, and those three vertices then must have a mass of one to, to um, get at these barycentric coordinates that sum to one. So row sums are one. So let, let's have a look in a minute. Um, so let, let's have a look at what this looks like. So uh, I think this is yeah, this is way higher in the chapter. Yeah, okay. So this is an example of a projection matrix. So one row is one location and the columns are the vertices of the matrix. So typically we'll, one will have many more columns than rows. And so for one location, you, you look at a triangle defined by vertices Z1, Z2, and Z3, and the weights corresponding to the location S are defined by the areas of these three sub-triangles. So the, the proportion that one such sub-triangle uh, takes in this larger triangle is the weight uh, relative to the vertex Z1 and the same holds for Z2 and Z3. So you have three weights corresponding to the three vertices and then um, a specific um, yeah, process can be determined by weighing the values of that process at the vertices uh, like this. So essentially this projection matrix contains weights in order to be able to interpolate to a specific location relative to the vertices of the triangulated mesh. All right. So the values in the projection matrix are then used as weights to interpolate. Okay, in the book, an example is elaborated for modeling fine particulate matter in the USA in relation to temperature and precipitation. So what we have is that the response variable, which is defined particulate matter, uh, is assumed to be normally distributed with a mean, which is modeled at an observation level um, and with a constant variance, a residual variance. So, and then that uh, linear predictor mu i for observation i can be, is modeled as an intercept plus temperature with a coefficient plus precipitation with a coefficient plus the random effect, which is then a GMRF, okay, which is dependent on the location. So, and this one will be determined by the, by the solution of the SPDE. So before we can fit this model with the enough function, there are several objects which need to be created. So first of all, the mesh itself needs to be created. Secondly, the SPDE model must be defined. Also an index set for this model must be created, uh, which means indexing all the vertices of the mesh. Also the projection matrix must be created in order to be able later on to make predictions for specific locations. And one must create a stack with foregoing and also other data for estimation and prediction. So this, this means also data on temperature and precipitation, both for observation location and for prediction locations. So creating the mesh, it is done with pinna.mesh.2d for a 2D planar situation. And what it needs, it's a, does not need a lot. It, it needs the coordinates of the locations which it should take into account to create the mesh. If possible, it will put vertices on top of locations. 
it needs maximum limits in the inner area and in the outer area for the edges of the triangles. And it also needs a minimum edge length of each triangle, which is uh, determined by the cutoff argument of this function. So the mesh then defines the, the mesh that we have seen already, then define the SPD model, the SPD E model. It is done with this function, uh, specifically having the matter correlation, and it takes the mesh, of course, because this will be um, generated, uh, the GMRF will be generated for the mesh vertices. It takes a parameter which is related to the smoothness parameter nu, and it is also related to to a to the dimension actually of the um, of the space we are in. So in this case, it's the, it's a two D plane. So this means for nu equal to one, we get an alpha equal to two. So the formulas for this relationship are in the book, and the constant equal true. It um, requires it's actually um, it is the requirement we want to impose to have the GMRF to have a zero mean. So then we also create an index set for the SPDE model with this function, and it also takes a label. And essentially, this is just an index number of each vertex of the mesh. So we we also get a few dummy um elements which in this case at least they are all equal to one i think so when having prepared the spde model and the index set these will be used those objects in the inla function when defining the model we will see it later on and this will be the component in the formula so the f is always used to define random components and so it's the it refers to the s index which is just the location index one up to three thousand four hundred etc and then the model is the spde model so and then it will be able to fit this or to generate this um yeah this s this gm or f all right also, we need to construct the projection matrix, and there's uh, the convenient function in la.spde.mail.a. So all it takes is the mesh and the set of coordinates. Then we must create a stack. This looks a bit more terrifying, perhaps. So this one stack is for the estimation data, and then the other is for the prediction data. And so it needs a data argument for the response variable. This is for the observed uh, locations. So it also needs an A argument, which um, takes the projection matrix. It also needs an effects argument with the fixed effects and the random effect with the index. So, and the same is this very analogous for the prediction locations, uh, but with the difference that in those cases, we don't have a value for the response variable, of course, so we need to set it as missing. And of course, the projection matrix and also the covariates, they must be adapted to the prediction location. So this is a different projection matrix, which has been created for the prediction locations, and these are the covariate values for those prediction locations. And with just the same function, these are also concatenated as this. So in dot stack makes one single stack of these two components. So, and this is also why we will need to be careful after fitting the model to extract results because we may be interested in either the observed fitted, the fitted values at the observation locations or at the predicted values for the new locations. And so we will need to extract using indices um, that correspond to 
one of those um, stacks. So the tag will be an interesting feature here because that is also apparent in this full stack. So fitting the model, it needs the formula. So this is, this is the fixed effects. This is the random effect, which we already saw. So the spatial correlation. Then we define the form. We define the, the model using the formula. We say that the response variable uses a Gaussian distribution, as I shown before. So the in-model-stack.data function, it is a function that extracts the data from the stack that we have created before. And then we already saw this in an earlier chapter when we were um, using aerial data with inla. So the control.predictor with compute is true. It will provide um, a yeah, posterior summary for the fitted values. And the control.computes, in this case, with this option, it will provide the marginal distributions for the fitted values. So the fitted values, in this case, it actually both for the observ observation location, so the, the training data, you could say, but also for the prediction location, because they are, these are all present in the full stack. So also when the projection matrix is defined here in order to be able to predict the, the fitted values and the, the, the posterior distribution, this projection matrix, which is extracted from the full stack, is both for the observation locations and for the prediction locations. So this will fit the model and store all components in the REST uh, object. So as we already saw before, these are some important elements of this REST object. This one will show mean and quantiles of the, uh, of the, of the um, fixed effects. Then this one will show mean and quantiles of the fitted values. And this one will also provide the marginal distributions of these. So let, let's have a look in the book uh, how this goes. So, so we have done all this. We have seen this. Um, yeah, okay, so we, we are here fitting the model. And so, okay, here we get the results. So we can see when we look at the 95% credible intervals, that temperature is has a lower limit above zero, so it is significant, while the precipitation has a lower limit below zero. So it is not significant at the 5% level. So, all right, so, and then if we want to map these things, yeah, we, we need to, the, the fitted uh, value, so the mean and the quantiles of the 95, percent credible intervals. And we specifically extract those that um, that belong to the prediction location. So because we use the in model stack that index function on the full stack, and we filter this using the prediction tag, we get just the indices of the prediction location. So this is a way to extract the summary values of the fitted values um, for the prediction locations using this index. So we get the mean, the lower limit, and the upper limit. And so this can be then yeah, shown on a map. So this is the interpolated version of, of the data uh, using the covariates that we uh, had. So this is the mapping. And what you can also do, it is using the marginals to compute the, yeah, let, let's, let's look at this first. So we have seen this. So we can compute the probability of exceeding a threshold. So in this case, um, the concentration above 10 with the inner dot p marginal. So the inner dot p marginal, it's, it's just showing or um, it represents a probability up to a specific threshold. So if we calculate the complement of it, we get the probability of the exceedance of the threshold. So the threshold in this case, it is 
10 and there's also of course needs as an input the marginal distribution so we have assigned this into the object march and that's uh, what's been happening here because yeah this is really being done for each location so it is done for um yeah for using the as apply function so because this is a list for these these distributions for all the locations so this, it needs a function to be applied to each location with which is calculating this uh, probability of exceedance all right so and then this can be plotted and we can then see that in specific areas there is a quite high probability of exceeding this specific value all right i think that will be it for this chapter so it is rather complex in terms of functions and steps needed for preparation but all in all you do the fitting with one single in lock hole and then you can again explore these results in ways that we have seen in earlier in an earlier chapter already before okay then Chapter 16, it's a short chapter about methods assessment. And so here we want to learn good practices in model evaluation. And in part, this already repeats some things that we have seen before. So what we want to do it is determine predictive performance of a spatial interpolation methods. And this requires, on one hand, a method to obtain training and testing data set because you fit the model using a training, training data set, and then you evaluate the model using independent testing data. So testing data of a response variable, which essentially means that you have to split your whole data set into training and testing data sets, and you want to do this repeatedly so that yeah, you do not uh, get biased results. That's one thing you need. On the other hand, of course, you also need an evaluation method in terms of a predictive performance measure, which will with which you want to express the performance. So this one will be calculated for each testing data set. So obtaining training and testing data sets, we saw this in chapter 13 already, um, where we use simple interpolation methods. So it can be done with k-fold or leave one out cross validation. So leave one out is just a edge case of the k-fold cross validation. All right. And then the challenge is how should we make the splits in a in the spatial sense? And well, there has been some discussion in literature, but splitting is preferably done by random sampling because other approaches will either obtain yeah training and testing data sets that are more related to each other because of spatial correlation or they will yield the training and testing data sets that have yeah much less than average spatial correlation between each other and actually both situations are not really representative so the best way and it is explained in, the, in this in this paper it is to do this by random sampling and then use design based inference to obtain a overall measure of performance of the model so and then the performance measures themselves the some do not take into account the uncertainty of prediction so we have uh, used the RMSE before already, um, especially in these simple interpolation methods where we indeed don't have uncertainty of predictions. So that's the RMSE. And you can also calculate the MAE, that's the mean absolute error. So this is just the, for each um, testing location, the difference between the observed and the fitted value, but then in an absolute way and then averaged over all testing locations. While this squares this difference, takes the mean of that, and then takes the root of this mean. So that's what we can see in these 
formulas here. So this is just the mean of the absolute error. Well, this is the fitted value and this is the observed value. And there are M testing locations. And then we also have the root mean squared error where, where this is squared, then averaged, and then the root is taken, the square root. All right, so we also have ways to take into account uncertainty of predictions, which uh, is the case, for example, with the INLA predictions, where we have the, yeah, the, the posterior distributions of, of fitted values. So what you can do it is calculate the 95% coverage probability, or CP, which is the proportion of observation within that fall within the 95% prediction intervals. So in in a formula, this is expressed as this because then this averages zeros and ones once will be will correspond to the cases that an observation falls within the yeah the, the prediction interval of ninety five percent and while zero is when it does not so and then you get the proportion of course if you take the mean of these zeros and ones. Another interesting performance measure, it is the CRPS, the Continuous Ranked Probability Score, which is an integration on the response scale of the squared difference between the predicted and the observed degenerate cumulative distribution function. So in the book, there's a, a, um, yeah, a graphical representation of this. So this is the, yeah, the, the prediction interval at a specific location. And let's say this is our observed value. So we, we can see it falls within, well within the uh, predicted range in this case, but we can look at the difference uh, between this degenerate cumulative distribution function. So it's just a step function, which is zero here and one over there, which represents the cumulative distribution function for the observed value. And the cumulative distribution function, this one uh, of the prediction distribution, it is just the CDF of this uh, distribution here. So we can calculate the difference per, at each small interval on the scale of the response variable and square those differences and integrate them. So this is related, it's not exactly that, but it's related to this gray area. So the larger this area, the larger this CRPS will be. So the best will be very small values um, because on the one hand, we get an observation that falls neatly in the middle of the distribution, but also on the other hand, because this distribution is more narrow. So these would yield the, the, the lowest values for this CRPS. Okay, so these, or the things that have been explained is in this chapter. So I think that's all for these two chapters. So are there questions? Uh, I think it's, um, um, you know, that's a, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. All that right. Okay, thank you.